We're starting the plenary session. Welcome back to everyone. Today's plenary session will start in a few minutes and will be introduced by Elisabetta Kitanovic, Executive Secretary for Human Rights and the Commission for Communication, Church and Society at the Conference of European Churches. His All Holiness, Bartolomeo I, Archbishop of Constantinople, New Rome, and Ecumenical Patriarch will give his letter to COP26 from the throne of Andrew, the Patriarch, has launched great messages on the custody of creation, peace, and charity. Among all, his work for the celebration of the Holy and Great Council of Crete remains memorable. Here in Bologna, the critical edition of this council has been edited. Dr. Marco Alvera will speak with His Holiness. In 2016, Dr. Alvera has founded the Kenta Foundation, a nonprofit platform for the support of art, culture, environment, and education. And he is here as CEO of SNAM, a global leader in the energy infrastructures. Trained in economics and philosophy at the London School of Economics, he has worked at Goldman Sachs and any holding managerial positions of increasing responsibility. Last but not least, Professor Adza Keram, Secretary General of Religions for Peace, an international organization founded in 1970 to connect the main representatives of the world with the aim of promoting peace. Professor Keram holds the Chair of Religion and Development at the Rebrige Universiteit in Amsterdam. She has held senior positions since 2004 at the United Nations and since the 90s in other governmental and non-governmental organizations when she obtained her PhD in political Islam. So thank you. Um, Dr. Kitanovic, the floor is yours. Thank you. Today, the Archbishop of Constantinopolis, New Rome, His All Holiness, Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew I, we lecture on the climate emergency and the novel ascetic needed to jointly take sustained care of the God's creation, truly loving the whole world, in order that we may all live health, vibrant lives on the healed planet in peace and justice as the conditions that uphold our God-given dignity. I am privileged and honored with the opportunity to announce His All Holiness, Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, renowned as the Patriarch of Solidarity, that uh, has uh, deservedly earned the title of the Green Patriarch and been named in the Time magazine in 2008 as one of the 100 most influential people in the world for defining environmentalism as spiritual responsibility. The words His All Holiness will address to us on asceticism, justice, and energy in presenting the open letter to the 26th Conference of Parties to be held from October 31st to November 12th this year in Glasgow. This will certainly will inspire, encourage, and activate all the human community to selfless, genuine, and earn encounter and dialogue that will jointly search for the path to reconcile us as humans with the nature and each other, leaving no one behind. His All Holiness Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew I, Archbishop of Constantinople and the New Rome, was elected to the first throne of the Orthodox Church in 1991. Born in 1940 on the island of Imbros, Turkey, and being a citizen of Turkey, His All Holiness possesses a unique perspective on interreligious and intercultural dialogue, especially among the Christian, Jews, and Islamic faiths. As a ecumenical patriarch, he has journeyed through though the Orthodox and non-Orthodox world, alike promoting a universal message of love, hope, peace, and profound humanity. His endeavors to raise awareness and action for the green regeneration of the environment, together with his inspiring efforts on behalf of religious freedom and human rights, rank ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew among the world's foremost apostles in the pursuit of the mutual respect peaceful coexistence, and culture of solidarity. Your All Holiness, the floor is yours. A 
I greet all of you with love and honor. Your Eminences, Your Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to be with you and to participate in the G20 Interfaith Forum to urge G20 members to step up and respond effectively to the most pressing challenges of our time. We are grateful to the organizers for their kind invitation to address this forum here today. It is a minute before midnight for humanity to go forward together towards a sustainable and resilient future that promises to heal people and our planet. For that, we need to enhance the abundance of our best ideas and through faith to succeed in the decisive race to global net zero and to a culture of solidarity. Do we all have the capacity to hold the global rise in temperature below 1.5 degrees centigrade by the middle of this century? Will we all be able to mitigate the risks of climate change? Will we all be able to preserve the wealth of nature that nurtures current and future generations? Will we all be able to prevent the ongoing extinction of species and abate the loss of precious biodiversity? Will we all be able to stop violence amongst ourselves and against God's creation? Will we succeed in ending wars and in eliminating social injustice and the marginalization of our fellow human beings? The answers to these questions are multifaceted. We are gathered here today in community to stand firmly united in the faith that we are capable of succeeding in this essential global task. If we apply pious moderation and utilize respect and humility as spiritual guides to responsible and sustainable production and consumption, we will succeed. Only through such self-restraint, simplicity and metania, which in Greek literally means a change of mind, not only internally within ourselves, but also in praxis and concrete application in a form of a modern asceticism, ascesis, that is practice, the act of exercising, can we hope to heal ourselves and our world. The climate emergency, with all its disruption of our lives and livelihoods on this beautiful but damaged planet, is caused by the conspicuous increase of consumption in various parts of the world. We must free our lifestyles from temptations and the deadening forgetfulness of the conditions for living together justly and well in God's given solidarity and harmony. Practicing selflessness toward others and caring for the well-being of the community restore peace of mind and soul. This is the way to heal our societies. 
This is the way to heal this beautiful planet, which is God's creation entrusted to us for faithful preservation. When God first created male and female, he honored them as prudent stewards of our natural environment. Such an important responsibility to care for God's earthly creation demands that every single and collective deed is deeply contemplated and considered. An important part of this journey is already underway. It lies in the direction of commitment to green recovery and to in green and digital transformations. It started at COP21 in 2015 when prudence prevailed. There, we assumed the obligation to work together on limiting global warming to two degrees and keeping it as close as possible to 1.5 degrees, as promised in the Paris Agreement under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Hopefully, the upcoming COP26 in Glasgow, led by the UK-Italy Partnership Presidency, and joined by all the participating states, will result in nationally determined contributions and climate and energy adaptation plans that can move the global environment to the level necessary for the world to reach net zero. In less than 30 years, it is possible to achieve the regeneration of our planet. Imagine living free from fossil fuels. Imagine a world in which we take care of one another. If realized, the attainment of intra- and intergenerational justice and the elimination of abhorrent poverty become possibilities. We must realize this today because, paradoxically, the COVID-19 pandemic leaves us with a historic opportunity to build back better. As we stated just a few days ago in our encyclical message on the occasion of the beginning of the new ecclesiastical year for the Eastern Orthodox Church on September 1st, day which is also dedicated to prayers for the protection of the natural environment, quotation, we pray for the swift overcoming of the consequences of the ongoing health crisis and for the illumination from above of governments throughout the world so that they do not return to or persist upon economies, to those principles of organization of the economic life of production and consumption of exhaustive exploitation of natural resources, principles that prevailed prior to the pandemic. Further, it is our genuine desire that the dissemination of pseudo-scientific opinions concerning the purported dangers of the COVID-19 vaccines, the slander aimed toward specialists of the medical field and the unfounded degradation of the seriousness of the disease be terminated. Unfortunately, similar opinions are propagated in regard to climate change as well, its cause 
and its disastrous effects. The reality is entirely different and must be faced with responsibility, collaboration, joint actions, and common vision. End of quotation from our encyclical. To seize this momentum and take real action, we must realize the seriousness of the pandemic, of the problem. Unsustainable production and consumption damages the planet and all living species. Our generation has not, until today, sufficiently contemplated the consequences of its eudaimonistic drives to experience the sensations of progress and the pleasures of life for some and not for all. As a consequence, the heaviest burden was placed on the lives and livelihoods of people on the front lines of climate change, who not only are increasingly being forced to leave their homes, but also, especially women and children, become the main targets and victims of human trafficking and exploitation. The enormous sufferings of climate refugees to save themselves and their progeny from the perils of climate change must be immediately addressed. As our Lord Jesus Christ says in the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of, these, of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Displaced victims of the climate emergency endure these tribulations alone and unjustly. And yet, in recent months, many nations have experienced for the first time the devastating effects of climate degradation. Floods in France, Belgium, Germany, and Luxembourg, burning forests in Greece, Turkey, Serbia, Australia, and California, disastrous storms and prolonged droughts throughout Africa. Each of these are undeniable results of harms we have inflicted upon our Earth. These extreme weather events are our foreseeable destiny if we insist upon our enmity toward the natural environment. In this regard, it is crucial for COP26, which is taking place from 31st October to 12th November in Glasgow, to unify and bind us together in our dedication to heal the climate and protect our planet. Success in this matter requires freeing the future from slavery to wastefulness and unfortunate habits that kill the very prerequisites for the good life for all of us on Earth. In every Orthodox liturgy, we ceaselessly pray for favorable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, and for peaceful times. Every time we pray, we are reminding ourselves what needs to be done. We are longing for the moment in which governments globally will shape policies and create plans to safeguard the lives of people and communities threatened and affected 
by the consequences of the great ecological crisis. New policies must venture beyond the usual by producing only what is needed in sustainable and non-wasteful ways. In the Orthodox Christian tradition, monastics have modeled sustainable living for generations. Now we are faced with the opportunity to follow their example, to live in dignity and joy of a newly found common cause. It is not coincidental that a recently published book, 2017, entitled The Monk Who Became CEO, 1,000 Years Athonian Management, became bestseller by revealing the secret of success of the ascetic management implemented by the monastic community of Mount Athos and how it can present a prototype for new strategy and different value orientation in the philosophy of a modern company. In this spirit of modern asceticism, we call the major economies of the world to provide leadership in all these transitions to a green economy. Green economy refers to the well-being resulting from non-wasteful production and from responsible consumption. Green is the color symbolizing the life that God has given to all. Thus, innovative technologies for green transformations can, should, and must be technologies for life. These technologies must drive the healing of our planet by enhancing waste elimination the depollution of water, air, and soil, and nurturing our forests and oceans, we are making the major turn towards an ecological economy for the well-contemplated communal and global thriving prosperity of all. Through our contemplations, we can see a world in which coal, oil, and gas are left in the bosom of our planet while we are powering our mobility, production of electricity, heating, cooling, construction, and all our activities on green and clean energy. Such contemplations are not mere day dreamings. There are already well de devised technology solutions for the pressing energy problem. These need to be supported not only by pioneering governments, business enterprises and investments, but they should also be empowered by everyone engaged in the movement for de-investing from fossil fuels and the modes of production consumption that waste our future. We must now share these new technologies justly and equally throughout the world and invest in them from the south to the north in order to be responsible, accountable global citizens. To foster human talents, 
cultivate the faith of inventiveness and encourage spirited engagement, it is vital to promote quality education for all, male and female, without discrimination. Throughout the whole of our lifetimes, we must learn anew and acquire the skills needed to achieve all transformational agendas from the UN Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development to the UN Agenda for Humanity. Education for such new realities is essential to the dream and the reality of transforming our world to the one world of well-being, sustainability, resilience, responsibility, and justice for all. We need to assure that intergenerational gaps do not widen and that the green and digital transformations leave no one behind. Our youth took to the streets, the public squares, and every corner of the earth to ignite collective action aiming for the highest of climate neutral targets. Bonded and networked by inspiration, passed to us from our engaged youth, we are obliged to raise this demand of young men and women to reach global net zero. Our faith and ingenuity, our common devotion and inventiveness must be brought forth for us all to achieve in community these tall objectives. We need to join in the efforts of young people to accelerate our progress along transformational paths with full involvement of all those left furthest behind. We urge G20 nations to first recognize and then pursue the demands of our young men and women for a sustainable and resilient future. Thus, we must open our hearts and minds to the ambitions voiced by young generations. They are driving present efforts from the expedited achievement of sustainable development goals to reversing harmful climate changes and enhancing general conditions of life. Our younger generation, the largest ever in the history of humankind, will certainly make valuable recommendations at the Youth for Climate Summit to be held from 28 to 30 September in Milan. With truthfulness, and sincerity, we plead that the ministers in Milan at the preparatory meeting for COP26 embrace the visions and proposals of the youth as a voice of the future. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, unprecedented determination and human energy are required to free us all from enslavement to wasteful living. By devoting the power of our faith and the ingenuity of our minds to the contemplation of solutions, we can escape this bondage. As we are able to heal in community, so we are able as well to mend in community the wrong ways by accepting the goal of the protection of dignity and human rights 
of all people. Therefore, we urge the leaders of the world's largest economies to be the first to work together and coordinate their actions in support of a sustainable environment and of the common effort for global healing of the climate and for founding a just global society. Here and now, hic et nunc, individual and communal actions, brave and wise steps taken by women and men, by young and old, will empower us to make significant common decisions. We are inspired by a vision of a world united in well-being, sustainability, resilience, responsibility, justice, and peace for all. Truly, our shared commitments can heal humanity and its home, its ecos, our planet Earth. Thank you. Thank you, Your Holiness, for this wonderful lecture. Uh, Mr. Vera, the floor is yours. Thank you. Your Holiness, thank you very much for your words that have inspired me. I will now no longer follow my speech, but I will try to reply to the best of my capability. Thank you to the organizers for this incredible gathering, Your Excellencies. I would like to share my dream. It's a dream where we move very quickly to the world of net zero, where we move very quickly to a world in which the CEO is inspired by the monks. This is happening, ladies and gentlemen, because we now have the science of sustainability. It used to be an art everyone defining their own version of sustainability. But now we're moving quickly towards a world of ESG, environment, social, governance. I'm on the board of a company, Standard & Poor's. We will be issuing ESG ratings. So the company's success will be measured not by the profit, but by the ESG score. Young generations want to work in companies that have a purpose. Companies need to inspire the people to work with them, need to inspire the customers to sell the products. And we now have the science of ESG that will make it all happen much quicker than we expect. The E is very clear. We have to stay within one and a half degrees. We have to get to net zero. I have changed and have become from a skeptic and a pessimist to finally being incredibly optimistic. COP26 and 2021 will go, do will go down in history as the year when we achieve the tipping point, the year in which we move from a scenario of impossibility, of fear, of lack of action, to a scenario of hope, because only with hope we can have action. And I would like to share with you why I have become optimistic. We can make today solar energy 
five times cheaper than oil and gas, and four times cheaper than coal. The digital revolution and the green revolution have joined forces. They now work together. The digital making the energy cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Solar energy, when I started working in solar, cost $1,000 per megawatt hour. Nuclear energy costs $100. Oil costs $70. Today, we can make solar energy at $10. So we need to save all the energy we can. We will be adding 2 billion people. 70% of the children born in the next 50 years will be born in Africa. The economies need to grow so that we can address poverty. And so the economies will be twice the size at the end of the century. But we need to consume 50% less energy than we do today. So the first action is to be more ascetic, to be more like inspired by Mount Athos, and to save as much energy as we can. The second step is to electrify everything that we can electrify, because we have this cheap solar resource. Also, we have wind, also we have waves, but the solar is a real breakthrough. It is not to do, uh, uh, we don't need new discoveries. The technology is there already. And 1% of Sahara, would be enough to provide all the energy that Europe needs. So what we cannot electrify, we need to replace oil. The stone age didn't finish because they ran out of stones. We need to make the oil age finish quickly before we run out of oil. And so the solar energy can be used to produce hydrogen. H2O is hydrogen and oxygen in the water. We can use the solar energy to split the oxygen from the hydrogen, and we generate a fuel that behaves like coal, like gas, like oil, so it has the same versatility, but it's 100% renewable. When you burn hydrogen, you only get water as a consequence. And so this new discovery of how cheap hydrogen can be, cheaper than oil in five years, this is what we are bringing as our offering to COP. We have joined forces with some of the world's biggest companies, seven of us, and we have made a pledge, we will bring this to the Youth COP in Milan and then to Glasgow, to make green hydrogen cheaper than oil in five years. We presented this plan to the US government. They want to make it even cheaper in 10 years, to make it cheaper than coal, because only if we can get hydrogen cheaper than coal can we get India and China to stop building new coal plants? So this technology is there. Your Excellencies, we need people to buy into this vision, to talk about this. We need conferences, we need lectures. It's such a new technology that not many people are aware of the potential. And so we need to stop building new coal, oil, gas plants and move on to this entirely renewable. We then have the S and the G of ESG. The G, there's a lot of literature on governance. There's events where we create protocols, where we share information, where we avoid the pseudoscience. So G is very positive and very healthy and necessary. The S is where there's still some ambivalence. What does social mean? So here we're promoting the WWM, which is the World Well-Being Movement, where we promote the science of measuring well-being, similar to happiness. We want to have specific KPIs where companies, governments, public institutions are measured by the well-being that is tracked, monitored with scientific questionnaires. And over time, you can create some measures that, again, go beyond profit, beyond GDP, to really measure how we are doing as managers, as fathers, as individuals, as people responsible for the community. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Alvera, for all these uh, facts that you have been presenting. And it is my pleasure and honor to give the floor to Professor Dr. Aza Karam, Secretary General of Religions for Peace. Dr. Karam, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. In the name of God, the beneficent and the merciful, may peace be upon you all. Your All Holiness, Eminences, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, and especially this community of people of faith and friends, thank you. Thank you. I wish to begin by giving my sincere gratitude to the organizers of the um, G20 Interfaith Forum here I would begin by also thanking the government of Italy for this very gracious hosting in this most beautiful of places. I would also wish to specifically mention um, three professors who are great minds in this space and who have helped to convene us all here today, particularly Professor Catherine Marshall, Professor Cole Durham, and Professor Alberto Meloni. I wish to thank them personally and professionally for the opportunity to be with you all here today. Your All Holiness, you felt and clearly saw the intensity of emotion in the room when we heard your words. Your words resonate deeply, passionately, and powerfully within our spirit because you, among many things, speak truth to power and because you have spoken this truth for many, many, many years, you are referred to as the Green Pope long before it became um, fashionable to be green. Your words resonate because you are a religious leader. And I ask you all to consider the impact if we would have all religious leaders, all leaders of faith present with us and powerfully echoing and speaking as one along the lines of what His Old Holiness did. Can you imagine that power? Can you imagine how anything could possibly stand in the way of the very needed transformation that His All Holiness spelled out and laid out? I want to thank you for sharing your dream. Your dream echoes powerfully as well but you did not only share your dream, you also told us how we could get there, which is wonderful. Now imagine if all CEOs were able to adopt the mantra that you shared. It would mean that we really have nothing stopping us from transforming the world that we wish to the world that we must have. What is missing today is not the powerful words of religious leaders or political leaders or business leaders. We have at our disposal, almost in every corner of the world, those agents of transformation, spiritual, political, economic, cultural, and financial. We have today the agents of transformation, the young people who are not just the stewards of tomorrow, but very much the caretakers of today. We do not lack for resources, ladies and gentlemen. What we lack is the commitment to work together to see each other as equals. What we lack is the opportunity to see through the identity of a religion or a gender or a culture or a nation and to be able to actually see each other in each other's eyes and to see each other as equal in the eyes of the divine. That is what we lack. We have institutions today in every single sphere of life with a remarkable legacy, remarkable history, and remarkable spokespersons. We also have institutions today who are struggling for their basic legitimacy because we have lost faith in so many of our institutions. What can we do to counter the loss of faith in our institutions, which is intimately connected to the loss of hope in being able to regenerate, to honor this very planet that we live on? 
I serve one such institution called Religions for Peace. If you'll allow me just to do something slightly different, would any of you who have heard of Religions for Peace please raise your hands? Not bad, God is good. Thank you. I therefore will not elaborate much about Religions for Peace. I will share with you that this is an organization that brings together all faiths, all faiths, leaders and representatives, young and older, male and female, and enables them and serves them to speak and to act as one. After serving in the United Nations for nearly two decades, I understood that the main finger that always points towards the United Nations and to many of our multilateral institutions is the finger that says you do not coordinate, you do not serve as one, you do not deliver as one. There are so many of you. Now imagine if we were to hold that same measure of accountability to our political institutions, but even more to our religious institutions. Why Religions for Peace matters is not because of its 50-year legacy of trying to serve the mandate of bringing the faith communities together as one, but why it matters is because today we need it more than ever. And because today, the institutional legitimacy that is being undermined through our lack of service is also a crisis that is manifested in the lack of our ability to stand together to serve our planet. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of the fact that the rainforests are the lungs of our planet. Let me repeat that. The rainforests are the lungs of our planet. Saving the rainforests from utter devastation and decimation, therefore, is a matter of being able to live, to breathe healthily. It, not, it is not and need not and cannot be a luxury. It is an absolute basic necessity of survival on this planet. Religions for Peace has committed, thanks to the stewardship of His All Holiness and Metropolitan Emmanuel and many representatives of their religious institutions around the world, Religions for Peace has been committed to the Interfaith Rainforest Initiative, which it launched in 2019. The understanding is that even though the rainforests today, the bulk of the rainforests today, exist in only five nations in our world, those five nations carry the bulk of the lungs of our planet. And the understanding is that no political institution today can deliver on its own. No business institution or even no conglomerate of business institutions today can deliver on its own. And no religious institution today can deliver on its own, even were all the different factions within to come together. So therefore, just as it is absolutely critical for us to work together to save our rainforests, it is critical for us to work together full stop. I have examples here from the Interfaith Rainforest Initiative from countries like Colombia and Peru, DRC and many others. But rather than tell you the examples which are easily available, I want to share one thing very much with you, and please bear with me. And I promise, Ms. Kitanovic, that this will be the conclusion. Of course, I stand in front of you as the servant of Religions for Peace, the United Nations of Religious Institutions. But more than anything, I also stand in front of you as a woman, as an Arab, as an Egyptian, as a Muslim, not necessarily in that order and that is only part of my identities. I notice that this voice has not exactly been re ringing in this forum so far. So allow my voice to ring for a minute. What we are lacking today from individual to institution, from community to nation to globe, is accountability. Accountability for one another. It isn't about representation, and it should not be about representation. I do not represent all women, I do not represent all Muslims, I do not represent all Egyptians, and I do not represent all Arabs, even though I am one of them. What we are lacking is an ability to work together in spite of our differences. What we are lacking is an accountability to the divine truth 
that mandates us to serve, to serve one another, regardless of the color of our skin or the gender or nationality or ethnicity that we carry, and certainly regardless of the religion. I leave you with a plea to understand that as you found powerful the words of one religious leader and one businessman, please find powerful and understand that it is up to you to ensure that all religious leaders, all businessmen, and all peoples can serve one another. Our ability to champion the rights and the dignity of one another depend not on ourselves. They depend on all of us serving all of us at the same time. As I hold our religious leaders accountable, I understand how important it is to go to the COP with a message for the governments and for the multilateral entities and organizations. But let us not forget that the first message is owed to those who were the first responders in every single social sector and humanitarian crisis, i.e. the religious institutions. Our religious institutions, ladies and gentlemen, long predate all the governments of this world, and they will long outlive all the governments of this world. As we hold our governments accountable, which we must, as we hold the multilateral institutions accountable, which we must, let us also hold our religious leaders and our religious institutions accountable to serving all, at all times. That is how we will leave no one behind. That is the key to saving our planet. Thank you. Thank you, dear General Secretary, for this wonderful address and reminding us once again that we need to work together uh, for the care of creation and protecting human dignity of all people. So, uh, our last speaker uh, was scheduled to be John Kerry, United uh, States Special Presidential Envoy for Climate. Do we have video input? We don't. Okay. So, uh, I have uh, one question because I would like to use this uh, um, very unique opportunity for Mr. Alvera and to ask, except prayers, what would you expect from religious leaders to do in this regard in the protection of creation? So, the, the, the role of religious leaders is incredibly important when we think about this new paradigm which will be much fairer because we can uh, produce and export the sun from all the places where we have the sun. So this will create new uh, development opportunities in countries that often don't have strong institutions and where religion plays a central role. And we have now gas pipelines coming here when we turn on the gas here in Bologna. The natural gas is coming from Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, through um, Turkey. We connected a pipeline that goes from the Caspian Sea across Azerbaijan, Georgia, all of Turkey, Greece, Albania, Italy. Imagine the different religions along all that route. Those pipelines that we use for gas today, we will use the same pipeline for hydrogen tomorrow. So my dream is to build hydrogen in Jordan, in, in, in Saudi, bring it through Israel into Europe, and you need to get a lot of religious agreement as well as political and technical. Thank you so much. Professor Karam, do you have any question for our CEO here who is in front of us? Oh, gee, okay. Um, I think I can't possibly let that go. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Moderator. I would, I would ask you how do you expect to get the religious leaders or the religious institutions to come alongside as you have that vision? So, uh, as, as you rightly said, we need accountability and we need to speak with one voice. So what I did is I wrote a book where all this is summarized and I'm going to tour the world to uh, present this story and create uh, my accountability because my name is on it, so I'm, 
I am accountable, but we need buy-in and uh, we need to share the information. The technology is there. We just need to get into a mode of execution and action. Thank you. Uh, we have come to the closure of uh, this session. I would like to thank to all of three speakers, especially to His All Holiness, for a great address and for the messages to the G20 economies for the open letter of uh, COP26, and to CEO Mar Marco Alvera for his contribution and facts that he brought uh, at the table, and especially to the General Secretary, Aza Karam, for enforcing uh, care for creation through religions for peace and inviting us to work all together for the protection of uh, our uh, environment. Uh, that we could live life in human dignity, not only us as individuals, also as communities, but also for the dignity of our creation. Thank you so much, and uh, see you later. Thank you, Ms. Kitanovic.